Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, welcome to our first Scholars of the Square lecture of 2024. Still having a hard time saying 2024, especially because I'm an 84 baby. So every time I say 2024, it just stings a little harder uh, than last oh, year. year. It's the year. It's the year. So my name is Rachel Brown, and I am the Program and Research Coordinator at the Center for Studies in Religion and Society. And I'd like to begin uh, by saying that we acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen, Songhees, and Esquimalt peoples on whose territory the university stands, and the Lekwungen and Wasanj peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. It's my absolute pleasure to get to introduce our speaker for this evening. Dr. Shobana Xavier is an Associate Professor of Religion at Queen's University. She works on Islam, Sufism, and popular spirituality, especially in the United States, Canada, and Sri Lanka. Her work explores the developments and practices of contemporary Sufism through the lens of migration, diaspora, gender, popular culture, ritual, spaces, and institutions, and she has written multiple books and articles on these subjects, including two sole-authored books and one co-authored book. Her book, The Dervishes of the North, Rumi, Whirling, and the Making of Sufism in Canada, published with the University of Toronto Press, is the first monograph study of Sufism in Canada and is the focus of her talk tonight. On top of her own scholarship, Shobana is also the host of the popular podcast, New Books in Islamic Studies. In her spare time, she enjoys hiking, watching movies, food, another reason why I like her so much, and swimming or taking swimming lessons, which she started just learning a year and a half ago, which is epic. Um, like all of our Scholar in the Square uh, speakers, Shobana will speak for 20 minutes, followed by 20 minutes of lightly curated conversation between her and our other guest for this evening, Simi Ghazi. Simi is a lecturer at UBC and is a conversation partner in Shabana's book. And so it's lovely to be able to have them continue the conversation here this evening. And after that second 20 minutes, we'll then open up to a broader conversation and Q&A with those in the Zoom room and in the room present with us. And so with all that, I am thrilled to hand over the mic to my friend, Dr. Shabana Xavier. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I have to say, out of all of the list of accomplishments, um, learning to swim in the deep end is probably my biggest one I'm <laughs> most proud of. Learning to swim as an adult is not easy. Um, so shout out to my swim teacher who's a grad student, a kinesiology student, Anyan, who dealt with all of my anxiety and put me in the deep end. So here we are. <laughs> and also thanks, Rachel. I just realized we've known each other for over a decade now, I think. Yeah, so we went to grad school together. So it's really awesome to be here and also to spend time with you and connect and see your life as well. So thank you for hosting and Scott and Noriko and of course Paul for having me um, to being a fellow at UVic. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I'm sure a lot of us both online and in person are aware of a lot of the things that are going on in the world and holding a lot and um, very sensitive to it as somebody who was displaced from a civil war in Sri Lanka um, and came to Canada as a displaced person of war, um, escaping genocide. So as we continue to gather in community, one of the things I've learned, or I hope, or one of the things I believe is that being in community is probably the, the solution to kind of moving forward and all of the things that are happening from Palestine, Israel, to Sudan, to Turtle Island. Um, and I think being in community is an opportunity to build solidarity in whatever ways we can. So I do appreciate when we gather in whatever capacity, because I think it allows for that opportunity and that opening. Um, and I'm also mindful of people's times and capacities to show up, particularly at these difficult moments. So thank you for being here. Um, thank you for, for all those who are online who are here. Um, Today, I guess we're here to talk about Rumi <laughs> in some capacity. Um, this book I wrote, I think what I'll do is I'll say a little bit about why I wrote the book um, and then I'll kind of set up what I hope Simi and I could just kind of bounce ideas and talk about. We started talking about it in Uber, so I know it's gonna be a good conversation um, on our way here. Um, so this book, The Dervishes, came to life. Um, I was thinking about how it came to life and I think a series of things happen. Books have lives of their own. So it's kind of interesting to reflect on what led to this moment. Um, I think one of the things as somebody who was doing her PhD in religious diversity in North America and doing a lot of research on Sufism in the United States, um, I started to realize that there was really nothing written on Sufism in Canada. There were a few articles. Um, I didn't imagine that I'd be the one to write it, but 
here we are. Um, so I think in some ways I wanted um, to kind of open the door or point to something, which is that there is Sufism in Canada, it's a big shocker. Um, and another thing I was thinking a lot about in my, as an academic of late, it's interesting because I'm an ethnographer. So what I do is I spend a lot of time in communities, talking to people, observing and doing all that stuff. Um, but I've been attuned a lot to archiving a little bit recently. Um, I think um, for various reasons, because I'm doing some research in Sri Lanka. And, and I think when you're archiving, you realize, um, well, what is it that you're leaving behind or what are you memorializing? Um, and I think historians think a little bit more about this is whose stories are not told often, right? Whose stories are missing and like, the colonial archives or official archives, and what do we treat as counter archi archives in some ways. And so in some of the work that I do, I think a lot about memory and archiving. And so I think part of the reason this book exists is because I wanted to leave some kind of archive. Um, and so this is meant to be an archive. And it is part of the reason that those of you, if you had a chance to even scan through pages, you'll realize the long chunky in it. Um, that was very intentional because I wanted to make sure that the people that I interviewed ultimately had much of the space in the pages, like literally took up space. I wanted their voices to be forefronted. So most of the book is actually built around interview data that I use. And part of this is inspired by Carol Duncan, who's a professor at uh, Wilfrid Laurier, when she wrote her book, her book, um, and Caribbean religions also have these huge chunky codes. And she had said that initially she was interesting to think about people's feedback and response to that. So I think I was kind of picking that up and I think I was playing with it. And as a, as a memory and as a tool of archive, this is something that I wanted to do. And also partly because a lot of the people I do end up speaking to are uh, Muslims, people of color, queer folks. And I think archiving their stories, not as a counter archive, but actually central to the story and took up space in my book was important for me, um, especially Muslim women. Um, so I think that was another reason this book was written. Um, and the last one was, I think, because of Rumi. So um, a few uh, years ago, my supervisor, a brilliant supervisor, Rina Shafri-Funk and colleague, William Murray Dixon, and, um, and I, we wrote a book called Contemporary Sufism, Piety Politics and Popular Culture. Um, very kind of accessible book. And what we were thinking a lot about was um, Sufism and how it's transmitted into the contemporary context. We were doing a little bit of historical analysis and then contemporary complements to it. And one of the sections in the book we do, we talk about is how Rumi got popularized, how, you know, actually it didn't happen on Twitter or Instagram, but it's been a typical place over hundreds of years where people were um, essentially because of colonialism and because people were traveling to different parts of the world, let's say India, um, and were exposed to different cultures, they started becoming interested in certain languages. And so Persian, for instance, is a language that became an important tool of transmission, partly because that's how people um, ran administratively certain things like East India Company. Um, and so the way they would teach people, non-Persian speakers, for instance, um, is to poetry, translating poetry. So some, sometimes they'd use poems by Hafaz or these figures, and people got to get little piecemeals in their classes to teach them to learn a language. And of course, as you're reading poetry, you're going to be impacted by it to some capacity. Um, and so this is kind of an entry point into which some of the transmission of poetry that we see primarily Persian poetry, and not Arabic, and I want you to hold on to that. There's a reason for that. The Persian poetry starts becoming representative kind of the way in which people were thinking about Sufism. And that starts kind of splitting this idea that Islam was in the Arabic language and Sufism was to be experienced in the Persian language. And this kind of sets up a bifurcation that we are experiencing, I think, with Rumi, as I make this argument in the book, and a lot of brilliant scholars have made as well. Um, and so this was a project that we had done, and this was a project that was on my mind. And so I really also wanted to continue on thinking about Rumi in a little way. Um, and I wanted to do it in a case study way. And so essentially, um, Rumi became a case study because I was thinking about him a lot to kind of use as a prism to unmap Sufism in Canada. So I'm not suggesting Rumi is the only version of Sufism that exists in Canada. There's lots of different versions and hopefully other people can write better books about that. Uh, but I just wanted to, let's say, well, let me tackle this thing. And so there's a series of genealogies or threads that led to this particular book and the Canada specific focus. So I guess I'm trying to tackle a few things ultimately. Um, because we're in kind of British Columbia, I thought I would give you a little bit of some of the BC history. 
Um, BC actually had a huge role, particularly Vancouver, the Seattle region, if you're going kind of looking at the Cascadia region, um, in terms of how some of the development of uh, Rumi focused Sufism really emerges. Um, in this classic book, The Last Barrier, which was written by Rashad Fields, um, there in the introduction, you'll see that there is actually a letter from his teacher, Roland Rose, who told him to go to Vancouver and to teach the people of Vancouver about kind of this message of Sufism. Um, and this actually becomes like a pinnacle moment in which this individual, uh, Rashad is British. He was in the Springfield's boy band. Um, he was a spiritual seeker. He traveled to Turkey um, kind of as part of that era of the 60s and 70s, um, where I was really interested in spirituality, landed on Sufism after having kind of shopped around different things. Um, and so his teacher ultimately tells him, well, you go to the United States and Canada, and particularly to Vancouver, and just start telling people about Sufism. And so um, the Shah came to Vancouver in October 1973 and had a first class at the YMCA. Um, there was about three people, John told me, and one person was somebody that had hitchhiked along the way. So really somebody who just wanted to come in for more. So this is a poster that they had. Um, and um, Shah gave a talk, right? And so this is kind of an, an, a moment of initiation in terms of thinking about Sufism, primarily through Rumi. So these views were kind of presented through Rumi and the practice of turning. So this is in the 70s, you're seeing this image of the whirling dervish um, that we'll talk a little bit about as one kind of meditative practice and experience of Rumi that we're seeing quite popularized today. And so I, I say this all to say that there's actually a long history of Sufism in Canada, one that just didn't show up in kind of 2000s or you know the 1990s when Lumi was getting popularized on social media, but actually communities were establishing Sufism through deep practice to Lumi um, and through the meditative practice of turning. So Rashad's teacher, Suleiman Morris, who's from Turkey, Konya, um, Konya is where Lumi is interred. Um, he would also start coming. He would come to Los Angeles, Seattle, Vancouver. And so this became kind of a hub in which the teachings of Rumi was transmitted to primarily non-Muslims. And they were practicing how to turn. So that's the meditative whirling that you see. And they were also being exposed to different aspects of Sufism, specifically through the lens of Rumi as well. So this lineage becomes one important lineage that I take up in this book. And the subsequent students of these kind of this Suleiman Loris and then Rashad Fields are some of the, the students that I essentially follow in terms of the community work that they're doing now. So Rakib, who you see in the black, is a, a teacher who has essentially taught some of the important rolling dervishes that I discussed in the book. And they themselves have taught, taught other students. So when you go to, let's say, an event in Vancouver, I think at UBC they had an event in December for the death anniversary of Rumi, and you see whirling dervishes, or you go, if you're in Toronto and you go to the Aga Khan Museum, or if you go to the ROM, where these big events take place with Rumi and with particularly this meditative practice or performative practice of turning, Sama, um, the assumption might be to say, well, this is something that's quite popular and people are just doing it. But what I'm trying to get people to understand in the book is that actually there's a really long genealogy that goes all the way back to the 70s and even further to some extent in which people have been practicing and maintaining this practice. And so where you might see on social media, people critiquing and say, well, what are these people doing? Particularly if the assumption might be, or some of these people don't look Muslim. And so get, there's a racial comment that's made of racialization of how Muslims look or who can have access to these practices. Interesting conversations come up in terms of, is this appropriative? Who are these people who should be able to do it? So these are some of the questions I take up. But in the book, what I was really intentional about was going back to the people who are in the communities who are themselves doing this practice. And I wanted to ask them what it is that they were doing it and why they were doing it. So I think that's the pivot that I'm making is that, okay, we're hearing a lot of this noise on social media and amongst people about some of these practices, but I wanted to turn that noise and say, well, let me ask the people who have actually been practicing this for three decades or whatnot. Um, well, what is it that you're doing? Where's your practice coming from? What is your intention? And what is the meaning that you give to it? So I'm hoping that that's what I'm bringing in. And so this is one of the ways in which in chapter four, um, I get into this topic about the politics of consuming Lumi. At the time when I wrote the book, I was thinking more about cultural appropriation. Um, since recent, uh, Luz Carr wrote a really great book on um, religious appropriation, in particular on yoga. 
And so I've been thinking a lot about religious appropriation and I'm kind of curious in our conversation if people have thoughts on whether it should be religious or if it's cultural. I'm still kind of thinking through this and I kind of leaning towards religious, even though in the book it's cultural um, and the book has just been out like six months. So it's interesting to think about how, for me, this is a process. I'm not presenting like a, um, like a conclusive idea or anything. What I am trying to do is forefront people's voices and talk about what, what it is that they think or um, about some of the practices they're doing. Um, so I think in the in the world of popular culture where you have so much stuff going on with with Rooney and the way that he's consumed um, from kind of Beyonce's one of her twins names is Rumi, Rumi Vodka, which is a really odd thing. Like I don't know <laughs> what to say about that, but let's just leave it there. Um, a few years ago um, when um, I think it was Christopher Nolan who was trying to direct a bio epic on Rumi and they were thinking about casting Leonardo DiCaprio. There was a huge like Twitter, like people were angry. So it was like thinking about that and then, you know, uh, Coldplay and his kind of uh, thinking about Rumi. Coleman Barks, who is um, one of the individuals who has popularized Rumi with his versions of Rumi. Um, he appears in um, Coldplay CD and one of the tracks reading a poem of Rumi and during one of Coldplay's concerts a few years ago Coleman was invited and he was on stage reading Rumi at this like live massive concert with Chris Martin singing so again I think there's a bigger piece and I think Coleman um, is this kind of again another person that people have lots of opinions and thoughts about he um, in you know in the 1990s started doing versions of Rumi self-published them and started selling them you know, um, in the West Coast, and now has become one of the most well kind of consumed individuals with uh, kind of uh, renditions or translations, quote unquote. Um, and so he has some Sufi connections. He has Sufi teachers, Bao Muhayyadeen, and a teacher who came from Sri Lanka um, to the US in the 1970s um, and died in 1986 and is interred in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Um, and so Coleman Barks himself is a his Sufi teacher had given him the inspiration to do the works on Rumi. And so a lot of the translations of Rumi's translations he dedicates to Coleman, uh, to his teacher. He kind of parallels his relationship with the relationship that Rumi has with his own teacher, Shams. So this is where it gets a little bit complicated in the sense that people say, well, Coleman is someone who doesn't read Persian or Farsi. Um, and he is using other people's translations um, who translated from English to kind of, you could say Shakespearean kind of English. And he's taking that translations and he's making, he would say vernacularizing it into his own. And his are the ones that have kind of been popularized and a lot of people are, are enjoying from Oprah to Beyonce to Coldplay, right? Um, so here's an example where people will say, well, is this an example of cultural appropriation? Um, any act of translation is always subjective. I mean, I think most translators will often agree with that. So this is something that we could also process as well. But I think set against this, what I did is I went back to the community, the my interlocutors and asked them about all of this. Um, so in Vancouver, for instance, in 1998, there was this organization of the Mulana Jalazi Rumi Festival, which Simi was one of the organizers. So we could ask her questions about how this went and what happened. And so again, this is something that's taking place in 1998 in Vancouver. A lot of these kind of events are taking place now you know, at the Aga Khan Museum at UBC in Montreal. So it is interesting to see that this attraction towards Rumi has existed for a few decades and these kind of events have been taking place. And, and so this is a quote from Rumi, which I'm hoping will transition uh, from Bazi, uh, Simi, sorry, uh, that will help us transition to our conversation. So set against all this, I had gone to my in various interlocutors and asked them these conversations, like, what do you actually think about what's happening to Rumi in, in popular media, especially when you yourselves are part of communities where Rumi is, plays such an important sacred role and defines your community practice. Um, and so this is something that Simi had said during our conversation. Mavlana here referring to, to Rumi is living authentically in so many places that we wouldn't you know to love. You know, so I don't make a lot of presumptions, but you know, the decolonial critique, which I think we'll talk about, I mean, all of these kinds of things, this is really important. We also have to make the critique and we also have to be aware of appropriation and these things. So I think we're looking from um, that perspective, it's good. But I do get concerned about looking at it from a narrow perspective on what is Islam, you know, and that this is a mirror for other things because it's a narrow perspective of what is Islam that leads people 
also to be kind of like, well, this is so beautiful. It really can't have much to do with Islam. Let's just remove it from Islam. And that's just the catalyst to get rid of the essential teachings. And it's deeply, deeply webbed together. It's like a content vessel. How do you separate them? So on that, I wonder if it's okay to transition into, yeah. Hey, this is part two of our Scholars of the Square experience, where we've carefully chosen an interlocutor to engage uh, Ivana in some conversation. I'm, I'm just here to kind of lightly lubricate the experience, which I may not need to do because you guys already know each other. So why don't you take away? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks so for being good. here. Thanks for, uh, yeah giving me another chance to be together with yeah. you and with all of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do you have a sense of, um, I don't know, does this still resonate with you after having done the interview, I think like maybe three years ago, this quote? Yeah, I think, I think it completely resonates. I, um, and you said it. But. Yeah, but I did, I, so, um, can't take it back. No, yeah. no, I can't take it. Um, well, we can, we can always, um, I guess we can reestablish our own position. You're right. We can't say it back. We we said it at a particular moment in time. Um, no, it doesn't. I, I was uh, telling you also that I was um, in a semi-fevered state, like in a couch, giving her an interview, keeping her a little far away from me, <laughs> maybe during a pandemic. And I was like, I was a bit rambling there. But um, <laughs> no, I think you got an important point across. But, I think, but yeah. I think it's all in there. So yeah. um, no, I think I we continue to think about these issues all the time. And um, I, you know, I think I, for me, it's, it's interesting because I have kind of two hats. I have a hat of a scholar and I'm in a classroom and I'm in a university. Um, and although I don't necessarily produce say critical race feminism, I am a product of it and I'm very much a recipient of it. I'm steeped in it. Um, it informs my poetry, it informs my Sufi, it informs everything. Um, and then on the other hand, as a dervish teacher, where the dervish literally means the one who sits at the dar, at the portal, you're sitting at the portal and you're really, um, that's the place to be very, very embracing. And it's the place to be willing to be the bridge. It's the place not to draw an ideological hard line not to call out, but to call in, to be willing to look for that like incremental shift, not just in the other, but in oneself. And so um, all of the critique, all of the, the discernment, um, that kind of the skepticism and the awareness of differentials and power relations and colonialism and uh, being a subject who is, you know, a subject of color myself, all, all of that's there, but it's where um, I have to really like go into Moses' prayer, which is Rabbi Shrahli Sadri, oh Allah, like expand, mm -hmm. expand my chest, expand my heart, expand my capacity. Um, and so sometimes to be honest, I think in those contexts I put up with, um, whether for myself or observing around me, um, it, there can be the racist microaggressions, there can be the Islamophobia in someone, and I see that they love Rumi, but really, that all of those things can be present, but I'm going to really um, be very vast, because there's actually um, a deeper purpose, and there's a deeper context within which a very profound kind of learning can happen. Yeah, I don't know if that yeah, I mean, you've been part of the Vancouver community since the 90s. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. You were doing your um, project, your dissertation, doctor work at UNC, and then came up, I think you were at East and then came up to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So you really came into Vancouver looking for a Sufi community and you kind of found these figures, these other teachers that I interviewed, John Bozak, who, keep, who were mm -hmm. kind of with Suleiman Morris and Rashad Field. And so you brought this kind of other energy to the community. But um, so you've been part of this for a long time as a, as a teacher and then also part of the academic world as well. So you've been seeing a lot of changes. Um, is there something that you noticed in kind of the early 90s that it's looking like different now in terms of the way in which Rumi or Sufism is kind of presented out there versus what was happening when you were kind of mobilizing and organizing the community in Vancouver in the 90s? 
I think, um, would you say like internal to us or you're speaking like- It could be both, larger? yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, when I when I came here, um, I suppose I myself had been, first of all, I come from family who are Sufis, like, um, you know, my father's family, uh, well, they're, they're South Asian Muslims and there's some very reformist, you would almost call them anti-Sufi Sufis. Mm -hmm. And then they're just like some very wild, uh, you know, drunken antinomian Sufis as well. <laughs> yeah. Pretty awesome women yeah. um, in my dad's family, <clears throat> yeah, who I, I really draw a lot of my, I think, like inspiration. And, and I think like some things come through, some transmission from them. So it's been there all my life. And, um, but it, you know, it was only kind of going to university in North America and starting to study Sufism with Michael Sells in a university. And that um, made me really aware mm. of Rumi and Ibn Arabi. And even though my parents embodied all this stuff in so right. many ways, but it's, you don't get it in Sunday school. I can tell you that, it's yeah. like not in Muslim Sunday school. Yeah, so, so that had been with me for a long time. And by the time I came here, I'm sure I had been to like gatherings of, a hundred different Sufi communities in Cairo and Saudi Arabia and all, all, all over places I'd traveled. Um, but I, I didn't know anybody here at all. Yeah. Um, and I was told by, you know, friends and teachers, oh, you know, go, we will find you. They will find you. You know, it was that kind of thing. And I won't even get into the story of how I met Sufis here because it was so funny and incredible and convoluted and someone gave me some prayer beads in Florida and the person who made them lived here and then I lost them. And then the person in whose house I lost them <coughs> called me and said, are you looking for your Sufi beads or something? And then connected me to a Sufi. Yeah. Anyway, so there, it was that kind of story. Um, but I think that we, initially it was very much like embers. I think when I came here, there was just very quiet embers from like the seventies. People were connected to each other, but there had been a certain, um, in, in this particular Jalaluddin, the, the Loras, uh, that whole turning, whirling, Sama side of things. Um, I will say like on the Hajar Janayat Khan side of things, mm -hmm. there had been regular gatherings that was very much present, but on this side of things. So um, yeah, there was just, there was a like a rekindling. There was some new conflagration that happened at a, I was at 2 a.m random gathering and the three of us were like oh let's we could do a festival you know it was a, a very none of us um none of us are into events management um i'm a singer and a sufi teacher and a prop so i'm the diva i walk and i do my thing everyone takes care of me people bring me a glass of water so like that wasn't my my gambit, you know, it yeah. wasn't my portfolio. Um, and I ended up being bad cop, which is hilarious if anybody knows me um, and knows about my executive functioning too. But um, but it was because there was something like we wanted to share. Right. There was really like a message mm -hmm. that we wanted to share. Right. And um, and that event you said was like full. Everybody said that it was so sold that, out. Yes. You guys were not prepared. No, no. So the, I mean, um, in 1998. Yeah, it was. You know, I, I I happened to have a job that was a um, like a, that I could work from home, which in those days you don't get very often. But I had a job to work from home, so somehow I did that full time, maybe at night, and I did this full time in the day for three months. I don't know how we did it, but it was what was there was an interesting, you know. So it was like what should be the elements so we thought there should be music so we had an opening night of persian and turkish music um and then the second whole day was teaching mm -hmm. it was all teaching and then there was going to be a big zikr um and the next day Zuleika led this <coughs> beautiful women's zikr that was extraordinary um what was what was interesting is that you know we were booking these venues and we were it's Vancouver. You don't know if anyone's coming. Who comes till the day before? You don't know, right? Like this much snow falls and they're not coming, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, one thing I remember like about this was that at one point I was panicked because we had thousands of dollars on the line at these venues. What if nobody showed up? And um, uh, and I went home and I did say um, to my partner at the time, I, I don't like, I'm worried. He said, why are you worried? And I said, what if no one comes? Well, what if? I said, we could lose $5,000. Um, I said, okay, so just give that to me. Like, I'll carry that. If you lose $5,000, 
now just like go do whatever it is you need to do. Um, like you can put that down. Um, and we came within a hundred dollars of our, you know, yeah. like at the end of the day. And, and I think that's something really important to say because um, from within, when we're looking about this question that I think you really wisely end up in your book saying like, um, when it comes to commodification, when it comes to appropriation, what's the criteria? Mm -hmm. We can't make a judgment. And I think in the book you're saying as an academic, like I can describe these things that happen. I can't make that judgment. But I think um, coming from within as a dervish person, you know, as a dervish, as a person in community, as a teacher in community, we do try, we, we need to have criteria. And the, the most important internal criteria for us is Nia. Nia is intention. So what's your intention? So our tension with this festival uh, was not to like occupy Rumi and make it ours yeah. in any way, whether as Muslims or whether as, oh, it's not really Islam, it's you know, whatever. You know, our intention was, um, we say like to serve the cup, to help human beings to be human beings, mm -hmm. to create community, to bring people together, to inspire them. That was our intention. And that's, uh, that's like the first part of, of looking at is something, is something an appropriation? Is it, you know, is it merely commerce or is it something deeper, you know, commerce and we are buying and selling? What is the nature of that consumption that we're offering people? You know, is it that sick consumptive <laughs> consumption that you talk about in your book, yeah. right? Is it, is there something about it that's like um, necrophilic or exploitative or extractive of this ecosystem? which were a long ecosystem, we're a part of like going back to that acorn, whatever that's Rumi or the prophet, or maybe something even before that. Um, or is it that uh, the consumption is uh, like we're consuming, you know, it's like the trees and the human beings and we're breathing in and breathing out and we're, we're all consuming, the trees are consuming what we're offering and they're, so in that ecosystem, every, everybody and everything is consuming and producing in a way that is um, generative and that is biophilic, say rather than that. <coughs> um, and, and that's not an easy thing to sew up and wrap up and figure out, but it's the ongoing process. Um, and I think um, if we are leaders in these communities then, um, or elders in these communities, then we have even a, a greater responsibility um, because like the power of, um, of this kind of destructive capitalism to just wash down, water down, um, destroy and desecrate what is very, what is infinitely precious when it is put out into the public sphere is tremendous, right? So, so we have to have a really strong awareness and protection. I wonder, and this is kind of a question for both of you, but I wonder, it sounds like there's sort of three cohorts we're talking about here in terms of people who are interested in Rumi <laughs> and, or, and Sufism. One is the kind of people with an ethno-familial background. One is the early 60s, 70s folks. And then there is the internet, you know, uh, there's the kind of meme Instagram <laughs> Rumi. And I wonder if there's tension between these three cohorts, um, how the earlier, if you will, the earlier mm -hmm. ethno-religious familial cohort uh, looks with, uh, with concern about the third cohort, the younger, hipper sort of cohort that doesn't really recognize, might actually be surprised if you told them this is a kind of Islam. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just kind of wondering about the, the tension between those three types. Mm -hmm. And um, also, if you took out that third type, just let's say there was no internet or there was no Coleman Barks or for whatever reason, Rumi just was not a thing yeah. among 26 year old yoga practitioners. Yeah. Okay? You took those people out. Are we then looking at a really, really small, non-growing community uh, that is super interesting in and of itself, but doesn't become part of the common cultural imagination? Yeah. So kind of two questions there, the tension, but also the sense of scale, I guess. Yeah. I would add almost like a fourth cohort yeah. and that is like a present like a young generation of mm. folks who are coming who are actually like 
angry at the past and angry at the internet and are like let's reclaim like okay. let's like a reclaim with me because we are like i think most of them tend to be like racialized folks who are saying we want to take back what is ours and are they children of the not okay. always okay. but some are and that's kind of the group that i end the book off on okay. um, and because some of the research was going on during COVID, i had initially anticipated a chapter on that group mm. but it was like the group that was most maxed out during COVID because they were the ones that are on the streets with black lives matter movements so they're really mobilizing because they were like this activist bunch so i think there's like another group who are also trying to figure out Oh, we're like critical of the people who came and popularized Sufism before us, even though they would say that they're like kind of like the first generation folks of Sufis. Um, they're like hyper annoyed with people that are on social media because they're like, you know, that's not okay. And then they want to kind of take back. There's like a sense of taking back. So I would say that's also an interesting cohort to add into the mix. I would say the scale of Sufism in Canada and also as somebody who studied in the United States and thinking globally, I think Rumi tends to co-opt the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and I think um, in some ways actually, oh, do you think, oh, I think that is. Um, one of the things I think the Rumi question, and this is also, um, Simi had mentioned this during an interview, it's like thinking about using Rumi as a way to have a conversation about Sufism, but I think, if you even take out Rumi, I think this question about Sufism is the one that's a little bit more interesting to me, which is what I'm trying to do. Um, and so maybe even I'm co-opting Rumi in this book to try to you know, make a point because people know Rumi, right? But what I'm really kind of interested in is this question of what does Rumi represent? And if he does represent Sufism, which I do think is like a growing phenomena in amongst the diaspora community who are Muslim, amongst the spiritually interested who are not actually, not all of them came to Sufism through Rumi. They came through Hazrat Tanayat Khan. They came through all these other teachers who were in the circuit in the 60s who were traveling on and teaching. Rumi happened to be somebody they heard that they were not the exposure to Sufism, right? Um, so I think for me, the bigger question, if we take Rumi out of the picture, is this question of, well, what is actually Sufism in the West, um, in Canada and the United States? Because I remember one of the things you had mentioned when we were having our interview is you said that if you went to Morocco, I think you said, if you went to Morocco and you told somebody in Morocco, you could be a Sufi without being a Muslim, they'd be like, what are you talking about? Mm. That's not possible. But if you went to Toronto or Vancouver and you told somebody said, well, I'm a Sufi, and they, the assumption never has to be that they're a Muslim. And so this is kind of what I'm really more interested or in. Or India. Or India. Yes, India is another I place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. South Asia is another place. Um, I was in Singapore this um, last year doing some field work, and the same thing happened. I was talking about Sufism, and I was telling people that I was meeting that there's people in Canada who would say they're Sufi, but they're not Muslim. And they're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Hmm. So this question about Sufism is really what ultimately I think I'm more interested in, is what is this relationship? <coughs> and you had said that I think Vincent Cornell when he taught. This is Vincent Cornell's, Cornell's Venn diagram, Cornell. yeah. Did you want to explain it or do you want me to? Um, you had said in our interview that Vincent Cornell when he teaches has this kind of three prong approach where um, you could say, well, Sufism and Islam overlap. There's a thing that's in the middle, but you could treat them as different entities. Um, Sufism is actually, the middle one is the heart of Islam. And the other version is that um, Islam is the heart of Sufism. Um, and I remember very pointedly during our interview, you said, yes, yes, and yes. Yes to all three of them. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, this is what's more of kind of when I, in my research on contemporary Sufism, this is what I'm like really getting at. And for me, I think Rumi is a way in which that I'm trying to have that conversation, right? Um, so I do think Rumi has become bigger than life in some ways, but I think for me, what's more interesting is to think about, well, how is actually Sufism like tagging on to all of this? And especially when a lot of people are not often, some I think because of social media are coming to Suf Sufism now through Rumi, but they might not even associate Rumi and Sufism together. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They would think Rumi and they would be like, Sufism is this other thing, mm -hmm. right? And so, I, I'm not so, com like, I'm more compelled by this question. Well, then there, there would need to be a fourth uh, image in that diagram. Though, Which right? would be? For, you, for the people you're talking about, where right. there, there's a big circle and another circle. Right, yeah. right, where it's just completely separate, yeah. actually, with no relationship. You're right, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, I'm trying to think about the no relationship. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, like, I mean, I think people know that there's, like, some relationship. Yeah. Maybe they're just, like, touching mm. <laughs> without the overlap. Relap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
It's in, I, I mean, in our particular community in Vancouver, I think it's very interesting because these groups are actually very much connected to each other. So um, like uh, in the book, she mentions uh, Majid Buell and Majid Buell received a direct transmission from Jalaluddin, uh, not Jalaluddin, from Suleiman Dede, Suleiman Loris, that said that he could hold the post, which is that position, which is symbolic of the sun, um, that he could hold the Sema formal ceremony. Now, without that person holding the post, you can't hold the ceremony. So the fact that we've held it all these years in Vancouver, every single year on December 17th, is because Majid had that transmission. Oh. Um, and if you look at the rest of North America, actually, uh, Suleiman Dede's son, Jalal Adin, would travel like from Maui to San Diego to LA, coming all the way up to the coast to Seattle, like in the weeks leading up, because he was the post and he was the one that was authorized. And, and he wouldn't come here because this was kind of Majid's Valayat and Majid held the ceremony here. Um, so we always, I would say this is like a great gift. And then um, he passed this year and he did pass that on. So now there are people who can, so that we can continue to hold the ceremony. Um, um, but that, so, so you have him and he was an elder and he passed away. And then we have, um, I guess I'm, I'm definitely moving into a little bit younger <laughs> elder than Ricky and John, but you know, but, but we have a lot of um, young people coming now many of whom do come from different Muslim backgrounds mm -hmm. and they're Afghan or they're South Asian mm -hmm. or they're Syrian or they're, and, um, and they're looking, they're looking to reclaim, um, you know, an Islam that is not, uh, yeah, it hasn't been kind of overtaken by the Salafism or the Wahhabism or the, the versions that were so, uh, ec they, that, that was really ideologically exported, right, from Saudi because of all of the kinds of money and power they had. Um, they were the ones who funded the mosques like through the 80s, who sent imams or had people come and teach, learn there. Um, so these young people like really, this is not resonating with them. They don't want to be part of it. They're coming into our communities and, um, and are very, very much regarding, uh, I've, you know, people like John or people like Rakib, like Majid, as elders. Mm -hmm. Um, and in our community, there are those who are Muslim, there are those who are uh, Muslim, but it's complicated. There's like alienated, embracing, you know, there's a whole range. There are those who you might look at them and not think they're Muslim, but they are. Um, so, and there's people of, you know, every other background as well. And it's very integrated, <clears throat> like, it's very, very integrated. And I think there's a, a very, um, like we really hold a space that's very open. So now speaking of holding spaces, <laughs> yeah. we have to now turn to the next part of yeah. the Scholars in the Square series, which is listening to questions that have been <clears throat> online uh, to, to Rach or to anybody else in the room. So thanks very much yeah. to both of you. Part of a bigger conversation. So yeah. Thank you so much. That was so fascinating. And I really appreciated what you were saying about trying to be in this like condition of vastness where you're not attached to any particular ideas or conceptions of Rumi. And I also really appreciated what you were saying about really looking at appropriation as a question around consumption and how something's being used and if it's being used in sort of a capitalist or extractive way. That being said, <laughs> I just took a, a class with Naveen Reda at the University of Toronto. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, and we had a, a session on Sufism and on Rumi. And I have to say, even for me, as someone who's like reasonably conversant in world religions, I really had no idea until taking the class, like how devout Rumi was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually seeing these translations of Rumi that reflect that, that are not the Coleman Barks mm -hmm. translations, they're like very different. Um, and it's a little bit shocking to recognize how much you're seeing a misrepresentation of something, especially when that misrepresentation is so prevalent. Like I probably mm -hmm. see Sufi poet, Rumi, blah, blah, quote, like, I don't know, once a month through via social media, right? So that brings me to the question to you, which is, like, do you think it would be important 
if possible, to reestablish Rumi as Muslim in the popular consciousness. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's, <laughs> it's really important. Yeah, I do think it's really important because um, I, well, I think it's important because Islamophobia is like is 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 so toxic and it's so powerful and it's actually deadly. I mean, right now we're we've seen like any number of of Muslims being killed in very public ways recently um, from the boy just in my neighborhood in Illinois where I grew up, little six year old. So, so it's it's really uh, important um, and you know I. I really like Coleman Burke's translations, and I have a lot of love for him personally. I know I've met him personally, and I have respect for him. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't think those translations should be out there. But even Coleman Barks would say, of course, Rumi's Muslim. But he would not say that Rumi was not a devout and practicing Muslim, you know. So um, I think it's really important. Yes, absolutely. Like, I think it's important that um, the vastest, most beautiful, most compelling parts of our tradition, which actually were and have been the heart of our classical tradition, like what everyone's been immersed in, Hafiz or Rumi. Or, um, you can read more about that in Shah Shahab Ahmed's What is Islam? I mean, he really addresses that powerfully there. Yeah, that, that we're aware that like whatever it is, this art, this architecture, this literature is coming from people who are deeply uh, practicing or identify, yeah, I know, identified as like pushing it back to a pre-modern time it sounds very strange, but yeah, that are Muslim. So uh, Rachel and Paige, and then um, Francis. So uh, one of our fellows, Devyani, is asking a couple of things to you, Shabana, I think. Um, so I'll try to combine them. So what made you curious about studying Sufism in North America and South Asia to begin with? Mm -hmm. What brought you to this path? Yeah. And what made you choose religious appropriation versus cultural appropriation or cultural appropriation is what's in the book. Yeah. But why are you even questioning that right now? Yeah. I think it's the question. Or would you say um, adopting teachings of Rumi in the West is an amalgamation of both? It's a, yeah. Um, so first I, I took a course in um, Sufism accidentally at York University when I was an undergrad <laughs> student uh, with Professor Mila Vucevic. So I often joke with her that I have her to blame for all of this, mm -hmm. right? So she was a brilliant teacher and it was like a really small seminar room. I had no idea what I walked into and she obviously just knew it all and just transmitted this joy. And we ended off the course on contemporary Sufism like, and that just like stuck. But it was in that class, a student had brought in a presentation um, and did a presentation that they were ill prepared for. They had played a video of Baba Muhaideen, and I think at the time we didn't have uh, translations in it. And Baba Muhaideen is a Sufi teacher who's from Sri Lanka who speaks Tamil. And I remember Professor Butrovich kind of was like really frustrated. I think of, I, my memory serves frustrated with a student when it was kind of like, does anybody know what this man is saying? And I was like, I do. And that kind of really stuck with me. And so this teacher I had learned about in Professor Butrovich's class because of a student who did a bad presentation, <laughs> um, I ended up going to write the dissertation on because I'm from Sri Lanka. And that translating in a class really, that does something to you as we're talking about translations. Um, so that was why. So the religious and cultural appropriation question is really interesting. Um, Liz says in her book that religious appropriation names something specific that cultural appropriation does not. And I think that has struck me. Do you know what I mean? Like the specificity of what we're talking about in some capacity, yes, it is totally cultural, but even going back to what you were just talking about is that we're talking about like a religious dimension and spiritual dimension of this individual. So if we're having issue with it, one of the things that I found compelling about our argument is that naming the thing makes us tackle it a little bit better. And so I've kind of been sitting with that with her book. Like when we talk about yoga or mindful meditation, well, we wouldn't be, I mean, we would be bothered by it when it's cultural, but if we're like really, really bothered by it because somehow it's like a religious dimension because it fits people harder. And so I was like, I'm so been really thinking through it. So I do agree that it's both cultural and religious. But I think I do often wonder if the religious thing as a religious studies scholar does something differently that culture, and we all know religion and culture are so interweb mm -hmm. that we can't really separate them. I totally agree with that. 
but the specificity of saying religious versus cultural is something that I am I'm like drawn to. And I don't know, and I think Liz makes a compelling argument in his book about it with yoga. And that's why I think I've been thinking about it. Yeah. So Demiani, uh, you and I have clearly spent a lot of time together in the last four years because those were actually going to be my oh, two what? questions. What? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I particularly the second part because I was thinking you could use that you could use this same Venn diagram for cultural versus mm -hmm. religious. Like, can mm -hmm. you actually yeah. even really mm -hmm. separate them? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Not sure that you can. Yeah, and I agree. I completely agree. There. I, I like the idea of naming that we're having an issue with, at least I'm having an issue with this case study because there's a religion thing that's happening. Do you know what I mean? That, that, and mm -hmm. I, I do understand that some of it's just cultural dynamics, but I think in a book where I'm talking about ritual practices and people gathering and all that stuff, the thing that I'm pinpointing to is like a religious act in some ways. Mm -hmm. So the idea, and I don't think the public or the person who's fighting somebody on Twitter, you know, know maybe it's perhaps in tune with it, but I wonder if religious appropriation helps us focus in on a little bit. I don't know, what no, do you think? No, 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 now that you're talking about it, I think, I think it, absolutely. I mean, like why, Tatya, why is it important that we name him as Muslim? Yeah. We name him as it's Muslim, so right? It's that, it's question, that religious right? appropriation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's... And like Liz Bukar makes the same argument about yoga. I don't know if you've read this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes the same argument. And I, like, do you find that it applies to yoga or you're kind of like not compelled by it? Yeah, I mean, I don't, to be honest, I don't find the question very interesting. Okay. Not, not your question, as yeah, such. Yeah, I don't yeah. find the issue all that interesting anymore because yeah. as soon as you start looking closely at culture versus religion, yeah. as we all know, it just all falls apart. Yeah. Uh, and then you get power. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. It, yeah, uh, yeah. And that's actually way more interesting to me yes. is, is both at the level of power, kind of the macro level, but mm -hmm. also the personal level of trauma and personal needs. Yes. yes. The other, the way of not dressing it up, but the, the way of framing it as cultural, cultural yeah. appropriation. It's it's interesting, but I don't I don't think it gets me very far. And I agree, and I say this in the book, yeah. is that I think we actually need to pivot away from talking about, as I say, cultural mm -hmm. appropriation, because it really is just like a veil that's hiding all these other issues, yeah. just power. And for me, namely, is this issue of Islamophobia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When people are angry <laughs> about Rumi being popular because people hate Muslims. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, as a popular society, like we are kind of okay with this openly hating Muslims all the time. But like, how could you say that or do things systematically, institutionally, racially, especially to Muslim women and all of this stuff, and at the same breath be like, oh my God, I love Bumi. So uh, Francis, then Rachel, and then Peter. Oh, Gary, if we have time, we're actually gonna run out of time, I have fear. Okay. So we'll keep our questions and answers. I can do mine tomorrow, but yeah. Gary is. Okay. I, I can do mine. Yeah, very, very great. Well, first of all, I wish you could have spoken longer and longer. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I felt I feel that I'm <coughs> I'm um, I'm on the, on the threshold, like, like you. Uh, um, well, we get here for several months, so don't yeah. worry. <laughs> uh, well, I look forward to it. Um, I wanted to ask you about about poetry. Mm. You know, um, to what extent are the groups that you were talking to interested in Sufi as in Rumi as a poet? Mm. To what extent do they know Persian? Um, I, I know of, um, I was in Edmonton and, and about literature, there were several, several Persian students who talked about um, Persian poetry as being the, I think, the most beautiful language. Yeah. What's the relationship of the beauty to, to, the, to, to, the, to the circles? Yeah. And also to what extent is, is poetry a, a, a universal language mm. which crosses cultures yeah. and crosses uh, forms like Islam, and Judaism. Yeah. Easy questions. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, I mean the thing with poetry, there's, so, there's so much to talk about. Yeah, 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 no, you're right. I mean, I think one of the things when we get caught up in all this stuff and naming and saying who can do what and who what can't do what is at the end of the day, if one were to sit with poetry, everybody should have access to poetry and everybody should have affective responses to poetry. I don't, I don't even think Rumi himself would have been like, you can't have access, and this is the only way to read it. Um, Shenyus Jan Muhammad is a poet I interviewed, she's a poet in Toronto, and she said, she herself is a practicing poet, um, and she said, you know, the minute that I put my poetry out there, I have to let go of control of it. Mm -hmm. That's the poet's task. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, well, we're talking about this guy 700 years later, and everybody's trying to claim him. You just have to let go, because once your poetry is out there, you can't, like any art is out there, you can't. Perception is not your own in many ways, right? 
In terms of the other question, and you probably can speak to this more, one of the groups I look at in the book is the Zawiya Society in Vancouver, which is a really amazing story. And this teacher who also passed away a couple of years ago, um, I think he was an architect. Maybe you could talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah he was uh, he was an architect and an artist, and he was Iranian. He was immersed in the Masnavi and immersed in uh, Rumi. So the society was created because he would teach the Masnavi the whole over about seven years. Wow. He, he would take seven years, and he was teaching it first. And he had a couple of these Persian circles where they were doing it in Persian. Um, and then he created an English circles. So within our own community, many of our own community have studied the Masnavi with him over seven years. And he was bringing in all the vocabulary. And I mean, he, you know, so, um, and in fact, there were also, um, you know, younger Iranian students, right? For example, who would take it with him. Maybe their Persian, to do the entire thing in Persian was hard for them, but they could have access to both, like have it mediated. Um, so the study of Rumi, in the original Persian is quite a large part of what happens for many, many people in our community. Um, but also, like there's no gathering where there's not poetry. The poetry is poetry in English or other languages that members of the community have written um, and performed. The poetry is Rumi in Persian. The poetry is the Turkish um, Ottoman uh, Ilahi repertoire being sung both in Turkish and in translation. Um, members of our community have done, you know, we have our own translations of many poems of Rumi that have come uh, from members of our community. That have, sometimes it's, um, there's one English elder of ours, uh, Peter Barkham Salik, and he's worked with one of um, some of the Persians in the community because um, he's a wonderful poet and his, his English is magnificent. Um, so they're working on translations that are closer to that original Persian while still being poetic that are maintaining those kind of Islamic elements. So yeah, poetry is just a huge part of the communities. And when we're turning, we're turning to poetry, which may be sung by Persians or by Turks or by South Asians. So it's just a whole variety of, of languages that we're working in. Rachel's urging me to go to Gary. Yeah. Okay. My, my question is sort of in the spirit of the, of the last one, which is I, I'm just wondering how um, even within these presumably flawed English translations, non-Islamic, non-Sufi readers are being appropriated by, by Rumi. To what extent is, is, are they inevitably being transformed by something that they don't have control of, that exceeds their intention? It's not a function of what they think they're doing, but that something's happening to them that's beyond what they think they might be doing, right? Because I, I think when I think of yoga, for example, I often think, well, yoga is appropriating those who practice it. It's doing things to them that they are not in control of. This is, I mean, this is the thing about literature is if it's working as literature, it leaves you different afterwards. And so I guess the way I would formulate it is, does the non-Islamic reception of Rumi tell us something about Rumi that the Islamic reading of it doesn't? And that, does that can be expansive rather than necessarily um, exploitative? There's like, I could say so, so well, I, like I wouldn't call Coleman Barks a non-Islamic interpretation of Rumi. There is so much Muslim language in there. It's just that there's many times where he's gonna choose to give you a different metaphor, right? Like, as he said, it's, he's like a post Whitman, three verse, this. So I think part of it is that he's a really good translator and he's a really good poet. So he's able to create something which is vivid and alive and which is not merely a translation, but is in itself a work of art. Other translators, have done this, you know, um, it, it, what he's created, they, they've become their own poems. And I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of the ones that maybe retain the Islamic don't because there's something didactic about them or there's something, you know, or maybe sometimes they're just not as good or sometimes they can be, right? It just depends. So I think that's, that's really, and I, I guess the word appropriation, um, I think it has for me, it has that negative connotation that has to do with the extractive and with the disjunction of power with with the colonial with you know and so I don't know if appropriation is the term I would use but uh, be, but to be transformed by a work of art which is you know greater than what your initial intention or apprehension was entering it um, yeah I think I think that happens it happens with Rumi it happens um, 
in many other circumstances as well. Yeah, I think people have either been to these festivals or public events and seen turning or gone to, um, um, <laughs> have gone, have heard poetry and that has done something and so they've pursued it. So I think a lot of the people that I've spoken to had said, if we were to think that the extent to which Rumi is informing people is purely on social media, it, it would be a lie. Just it, it could be a first door encounter for some, and those who are really interested will take the step to go find these communities, yeah. right? So it almost does this odd like proselytization work, wow. like if you're really into it. And for those who just want to do the click and like and move on, that's also good. But for those that like lingers, there's the lingering results in a pursuit. And most people will say, well, that's the that's the part of the journey bit, you know? And maybe that's the real work. That's yeah, the that's the magic. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's a good place to end. In any event, it's, it's a place we have to end, of course, because yeah. it's six o'clock. Oh. Um, so thank you very much. That was wonderful. So Sessional uh, Podcast uh, next week, same time, same place, same means of getting <laughs> access. We'll be giving a talk on on uneasy coexistence, rethinking minority lives in Turkey. So join us here and then and there. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Have a good week. Thank you.